to mundane matters. You probably know the Prague community, that holy assembly of the pious, observant, of nothing but rabbis, judges, beggars, and simple Jews, with spine bent over for constant sweating in houses of prayer, for constant floating in rarefied worlds, for constant dreaming in houses of study, for magical kingdoms and miraculous tents. You probably know the dreamy-eyed tradesmen who don't pay too much attention to business, who think of it less than snuff in their eyes. You need not look long, you'll find them quite quickly. They're there, the evil eye aside, among Jews. Does this make me happy? That's not much of a question. I, the Jewish poet, am that way too. Don't rush, please, to judgment, but hear me a while. Talk about marginal things, about mundane matters. Hand me a lectern and I'll tell you, my masters, of wonders, of strange, enchanted, and rare worlds. Prague may well be a city where I may be rewarded with warm synagogues, with palatial study houses, but it may also be that there are many other places whose riches are hard to fathom. For instance, for instance, one need but sail over the sea, one need but have a bit of daring to find there in the distance a land in the far off place where millions of treasures are buried. Pure chestnuts grow there, roasted pears, baked apples and pickled plums and dry figs and cherries large as a child's head. But that's still nothing. The streets there are paved with gold and with silver. Pearls proliferate there in millions upon millions of diamonds. And masses of gems, emeralds, rubies, rot there in heap in rubble. That's a real region, a land of pure jewelry, prepared constantly to celebrate princely weddings. But object as you will, it's nothing but froth, for there's not in that land a single blemish. And all the natives there, with no exception, were each of them born in the finest of silks. The objection is true, the question is worthy, but just he, Jonah, what is to become of us? You sleep away income through your constant seeking of cooked food in your holy books, by your constant sniffing in parchments and pages. He condemns me to poverty, the bandit, the murderer. Why does the one above look down? Why does he see? Why doesn't he drive him away from that thick Mishnah and defend the interests of my little infants? So right now his wife's like complaining, right? She's like, uh, he's so caught up in his text, he's not like, feeding his kids. He's like, poor, all he does is study. Um, he condemns me to poverty, the bandit, the murderer. Why does the one above look down? Why does he see? Why doesn't he see? Um, why, doesn't, why doesn't he? He, uh, he drives him away from the thick Mishnah and defend the interests of my little infants. See to what we've come, whole days of hunger, not a bite to be seen. What a fine conclusion. And little mouthlets help out their mother. The rabbi told us to remind you about the tuition fee. And Reb Jonah hears nothing and rocks more piously and keeps stroking his goatee and combing it with his fingers and bites it with his teeth and tugs at it and sucks it. Oh dear God, oh Father. And his wife nags on. Chewing your beard won't feed your children. What that you saw, what would that you saw out some sort of work or travel to earn enough money for the children, for the children's milk? And tears flow from her eyes. He is not sane, and spittle drips from the children's mouths, senseless, senseless. Where was he? Find a clear, distant answer, and it came to pass, for reasons you know. The Jew truly lost his mind, packed in a bundle, three heads of garlic, a little loaf of bread, his prayer shawl and phylacteries, and, and Jonah's off on a journey, sitting in a boat, risking his life. So now he's about to start his journey to this fantasy land. The sea has its thousands of separate feelings, its will and its habits, the miracle happened to Jonah because of his Zohar, bound in the skin of non-kosher sheep. And Reb Jonah feels in the ship like the Prophetine, the court of the great and blessed Leviathan. The ship has been sailing a month long and racing, bathed in the auras of sunlight and moonbeams, and truly, my friends, like that yonder escape grace who managed to sleep through the heaven on this earth. Thus, my masters, the whole ship, its sailors, were flooded with water. The tragedy happening not far from majestic, from marble shorelines, not far from the gilded, shining, and dunes, not far from the primeval, heaven blue mountains. Grabbed by his coat skirt was the wandering scholar, seized by the nape and almost devoured as delicacy, stuffed fine and peppered, and he'd already closed in fear and, pi and piety. Oh, shit, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, uh, where was I? And s <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. And so the bird carried him, we'll go back to the poem. 
And so the bird carried him over the cloud banks, carried him quickly, the exhausted scholar. But that's not a miracle, really. It's quite common. A thing that occurs to each common Jews. We fly in the air. We live in the cloud banks, suspended, twixt heaven and earth, the middle. So now in the skies, the high-flying Joan of faith, that is God, would come to his rescue. And just as the stars drip down from his eyes, <laughs> and just as the, 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 the stars drip down from his eyes, just as he murmurs a trembling prayer, he sees himself lying on a satin-clad stairs, stretched out in comfort, but breadthwise and lengthwise, and in the stairs themselves sled to a palace, but entirely of diamond long. Yeah. Oh shit, oh god, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> He hears a silver whisper, uh, who are you, you stranger, you brash one? So now he's in the land and he's met this princess, okay? Uh, who are you? And this is her speaking to him. Ah, oh, shit. God damn it. Uh, what am I doing now? Um, oh, we're right here, okay. Sorry. Talking about the princess, my father, their master, will swallow you whole. So she's like, she's like saying, she's threatening him with her father, that he's like an evil king. My father, their master, will swallow you whole. Um, uh, uh, God damn it! Okay, sorry. was like very sexual um, and, and uh, like erotic um, as the cat meows. <laughs> okay, every princess can rail on for ages. It is, it is, it is as well known a general woman's failing. She speaks sweetly with great pleasure and Jonah prays to God and Jonah prays to God that she'll finish soon. In short, she relates an old witch once stole her mother for the harem as his Modius behalf, to be chosen a wife for him. And she was the most beautiful of women, about as beautiful as the Shulamite. Light rays quite often vied to kiss her tiny steps, while, meanwhile, winds and breezes contended in her heartfelt passion for the honor, the privilege of, of playing with her wonderfully pale hair, um, with her wonderfully pale hair, and the earth would feel the feel of her steps, and wherever her little foot stepped while dancing, their quorums of flower buds proliferated and bloomed from beneath the earth. But Satan grew jealous and chose her as a sacrifice, and she died and left me as an inheritance for heaven. So this is the princess talking about her mom, uh, the sun and the stars. And my father fell into the deepest wrath, and a wild uh, caprice overwhelmed him, and he beheaded all his slaves, covered his gray body with ashes, hatred against me, flamed up within him. His anger was directed entirely at me, and he locked me up here in the palace forever, for eternity. And while I was fed up with boredom, in constant solitude, 
Oh, shoot, sorry. Another thing. Okay. Scared off the dog, I think, huh? Um. So this is Jonah, and he's like, he's finally made this part of shit. Sorry. Sorry. Well, it's going to be loud as a dog here.
Okay. All right, guys. I know this is an epic poem, so it's almost over. Um, okay. It's hard. Okay. Once Reb Jonah dreamt that he had come to Prague as a traveler, and that he was... So this is him. He's been in this land. He's been partying. He's had this amazing time, and now he's starting to miss his home. He's starting to miss Prague. Um, once Reb Jonah dreamt that he had come to Prague as a traveler, and that he was in synagogue, and had repented, and he supported by boy baritones and by two little screamers, both his sons, and he sobbed sweetly in great joy. He sees himself in his home, and the candlesticks gleam. And Jonah, for his part, had not forgotten the homey streets of the Prague ghetto, his wife and his children, the warm study houses. He was sick unto death of the bunch with the horns. He pined for his dream, for his pre-dreamed soul, for singing leaders of prayer, preachers and studiers. Once in the desert, the wandering Jews pined terribly for the fish of Egypt. It's hard, dear Jews, it's hard, dear Jews, take this for examples. To satisfy an ordinary Jew with Sabbath candles on the table, with fish and the egg bread, as he sinks happily into the house and calls out loudly, Peace be unto you, and rubs his hand and glances at the bowl, where there now lies congealed a heavenly dish, a shimmering, transparent, calf's foot jelly. And as he dreams, he converses in his dream, and he feels the taste of the carrot pudding, smells its aroma, the princess begins to slowly, slowly, slowly to take Reb Jonah from his lovely dreams. And he's dreaming, and she's waking him up. I see, says she, O oh, Jonah, you're pining and, and progs in your vision, both waking and sleeping. So be it, I'll let you return, but for one year, be sure to come back here and travel in good health. And off he goes, flying on the back of the devil, without rest or surcease above, uh, above many countries, above many townlets and mountains and valleys and forests and meadows and precipitous elf cliff sides. There are not in the clouds any quiet, any quiet guest houses. There are not in the clouds any stores or nice taverns. And the devil won't tarry for even a moment, for even a moment to swab out his throat with a dramlet of liquor. He just keeps on blowing his devilish ram's horn, driving off cloud banks and blue skies and bright stars. Even if, even if the sun has retreated in great fear, and all that is heard is the beating of wings here, and now appear clearly the familiar towers of Prague and the ghetto. He flies like a demon. The night is a blue one, and Jews sanctify the newest of moons as in days, as days gone by. Um, okay, an epic, epic poem. Pleasantly, pleasantly, 
surely of newfangled wonders of how he went flying to storied countries and blessed new di districts that he had seen with his very own vision of hanging in midair, of being, a, of being a rabbi to an emperor's children, of teaching them Torah, of having grown rich and returning here right now, having earned while absent a mountain of money, enough to live well and well in the future. He brought along with him a fine piece of gold as big as, as, big as a very large pumpkin. What do you think of Reb Jonah? He's living like a duke, so now he's back in Prague and he's rich and he has a lot of money and, and um, the community is sort of like really into him. Um, he owns three long coats, a prayer shawl of silken cloth, a snuff box of pure silver. His little goatee has acquired an attractive hot bourgeois part in the middle, and he's acquired a satin jacket to wear for morning study and half a dozen crisp white collars. And he's become a man of influence in the ghetto, a trustee of the synagogue, and in the burial society, no less than our teacher. Reb Jonah, and as time goes on, he's more high and mighty. So he's kind of gaining power in this community, and, and he's um, becoming a really respected man. Um, entirely forgotten are the wonderful times. The castle and the miracles are forgotten entirely. But here comes the spring with its new anticipation, arriving with grasses, with birds, and with flowers. And there across the sea, the beautiful princess is taken to waiting and yearning. He may have forgotten, but she's not forgotten the little frog drew, her black knight. Um, her black knight, sorry. Impatiently, she stares outdoors through the window and angrily tears, tears the calendar pages. A year has passed, the time has come, so now she wants him to come back. And we're almost done. We've got one more stanza here. Alright, here we go, one more stanza. Yeah. All right. There's more. Uh... 